Hey guys! I love a classic Hey Guys intro. That's my helicopter and people have asked, uh, can you do a walk around on it? The answer is, yes I can. Let's take a look, shall we? My helicopter is a 1978 Enstrom 280C and before you ask, Enstrom is an American manufacturer, not that many people know about it. It's comparatively small in the world of helicopters. I learned in Robinsons, like in the Robinson R22 and the Robinson R44. Uh, the Enstrom is kind of an interesting bird. I really like it. Uh, it's got some distinct features. I guess number one would be the rotor system. But that sounds boring as the beginning of a video, so let's talk about some of the other stuff, like the fact that it'll seat three. The cabin is one of the big reasons why I bought an Enstrom. So if you take a look in here, there's a three-seat bench. So a uh, pilot sits on the left side, which is a little unusual for helicopters. Oftentimes, helicopter pilots will sit on the right side. But I'm on the left there. And the reason, because the collective control is on the left side of the pilot, putting the pilot on the left side means there's all this space in the middle to have two occupants. My daughter sits right here in the middle, in the cute little seat here. And then my wife can sit right here. Yeah, airplane going overhead. That's going to happen a lot today. I can absolutely fly with two other adults. It gets a little bit cramped in here, but it's workable. I've got four point shoulder harnesses. If you want, this little cushion right here, you can pop it out. And then there's a receptacle to put a collective control there. And then the cyclic can go attach right here. So you can have co-pilot controls. With the co-pilot controls in, then it only seats two. Another big reason why I chose the Enstrom is right here on the co-pilot side, behind this door is a cargo hold. So this may not seem like a vast amount of space, but if you've ever flown in an R-22, which is a tiny little two-seat trainer helicopter, uh, the only cargo space is literally under the seats, these tiny little nooks. Whereas this space, I can put like a whole rollaway bag and the cover for the helicopter and other gear. So it's actually a ton of space if you want to do overnight travel. In fact, I've flown this helicopter up to uh, San Francisco with my wife, flew it out to Las Vegas for SEMA, uh, flew it up to Lake Tahoe for a G Jeep Wrangler event uh, down to San Diego recently for the Kia Soul, if you saw that video. This is a good moment to mention that my helicopter recently came out of maintenance, so it's got grease flung all over it. When you grease up the rotor head, things kind of fling around. And then I haven't had a chance to wash it, and the last thing I did was fly through a rainstorm and some snow. So there's uh, all sorts of streaks and debris and, and crap. So this is not how clean I like to have the helicopter, but you know, field happens. Just in front of the luggage area, we've got the engine. It's accessible via two doors, one on this side, one on the, uh, the pilot side. This flips right up. It's a Lycoming HIO 360. Uh, that is a uh, fuel injected and turbocharged engine. 360 refers to cubic inches. If you do the conversion, that's 5.9 liters. It's a 5.9 liter turbocharged four cylinder and it makes 205 horsepower. If you're using automotive standards, that is an awful lot of displacement and forced induction to only achieve 205 horsepower. But in the aviation game, reliability definitely outranks pure power. This is the intake side. So uh, air comes in through a scoop up here on the door, uh, in through the air filter. Uh, this is the oil cooler. On the other side, that's where the turbocharger is. Let's go take a peek. Oh, and then to lock it, you just have these little uh, rotating fasteners. Tighten. 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 The other side's where the air goes in. This is the side where the air comes out. Here's your exhaust. And as you might guess, there's a turbocharger hiding behind here. There she is in all of its sort of skanky shrouded glory. Up top, we've got one fuel tank here, one on the other side. Uh, each carries 20 gallons for a total of 40, as you might guess. Uh, that's uh, 240 pounds worth of fuel. People always ask, how long can I fly? The Enstrom burns right about 16 gallons an hour, 15, 16. So I can fly pretty comfortably for about two hours. Um, by that time, you know, if you're in a helicopter, you're probably ready to get out and stretch your legs anyway. So that's not too, too bad where endurance is concerned. As we make our way rearward up top, we've got the tail rotor drive shaft, sits on top of the tail boom here. It comes all the way back past the uh, horizontal and vertical stabilizers and uh, drives this little gearbox right here. Here's the tail rotor, it teeters. And then these cables, 
These adjust the tail rotor pitch. They're directly connected to the anti-torque pedals up there. So when I'm sitting in the pilot position, the things I'm moving with my feet, those pull these cables this way or that way. And you can see that when it pulls this way, it pulls here, pushes this this direction. These pitch links change the pitch of the, uh, the tail rotor. You can go the other direction. Oh, these weak journalist hands can't do this well. Duh. If you look back, you'll notice that the tail surface sits underneath the boom. I think it looks pretty cool, but it's not a ton of tail surface. So the helicopter will do something called sharking. So when you're uh, flying and it's um, a little bit turbulent, the helicopter will move back and forth like this, but with less style. So I'll wait for the airplane to go by. Go, go, dip, get out of here, go, go, make it a video. Another interesting thing about aviation technology is that it's super dated. Uh, this is an air-cooled engine. Air goes in the top through that uh, intake up there, and then it's, uh, got, there's a big fan, and it just routes the air right past it. The, uh, one of the key reasons is that you don't have the weight of a liquid cooling system, and it's just simpler. In aviation, you want things to keep running, so simplicity and lightweight are really key. Down here at the skids, we've got oleo struts, which uh, help damper the helicopter as it's on the ground. If a multi-bladed helicopter sets down in the wrong way, it can create a vibration that is uh, quickly amplified and can destroy the helicopter. Uh, but because the Enstrom sits on these oleo struts, uh, I won't say it's completely immune to that, but it's largely immune to that, which is nice. You know when you buy a car and the first time you put something that's yours on it, it really kind of feels like yours. You put your 99% Angel license plates around on the back, classy. Uh, I feel it the same way when I put these little steps right down here. My wife is fairly short and getting into the helicopter can be a little bit of a chore for some people. So uh, adding these little steps makes that a lot easier. Also, it's a great place to kick your shins. I have like a non-stop supply of bruises on my shins because I'm constantly hitting these. So they're a mixed blessing, but they do make the helicopter look like mine. So I don't get it mixed up with all those other end screens out there. Underneath the nose of the helicopter, we've got a pitot tube and the uh, radio antenna. And then if we come over here, LED light, place for GoPro, because you know, it didn't happen unless you captured on a GoPro. And over on the pilot side, we can talk about the controls real quick. Uh, I did a separate video just talking about helicopter controls, but to just take a closer look, this is the collective right here, and any helicopter you'll ever see, it's controlled by the pilot's left hand. You pull it up to make the helicopter go up, and down to make the helicopter go down. And then, unlike a lot of helicopters, mine doesn't have a governor to maintain rotor speed, so I have to do that manually. And I do that by rolling this throttle on and rolling it off, just like a motorcycle. This one right here, this is called the cyclic. You might call it the stick, but you push forward to make the helicopter go forward, back to make the helicopter go back. Right, it'll angle right, left, angle left. And then down there in front, there's the uh, pedals I was talking about. Those are called the anti-torque pedals. Uh, you use those to uh, change the direction the nose is pointed. And depending on how much power you're pulling with the collective, you have to counteract the torque going to the main rotor with the tail rotor. So if I pull up on the collective and I start to, to gain altitude, I actually have to add left pedal. If I uh, flip the camera around, you can see the, uh, the pitch angle for the blades on the tail rotor uh, change. Left pedal, right pedal, left pedal, right pedal. In the cockpit, we've got a spot here to plug in the headsets. Uh, here's the center cushion that I mentioned. It's removable. So you might be wondering where the doors are. I almost always fly doors off. Not only is it a, a much better view of the world around, but it just keeps the uh, cockpit nice and cool. Kind of like owning a Miata, you should always drive it top down. Owning a helicopter, if you have the option, you should uh, always fly doors off. Unless you're on your way to your tax advisor and you have a cockpit filled with documents and you think they might fly out the window. Otherwise, keep the doors off. Oh, and I will mention too, it's a good segue. When I first started flying, we had paper charts. A lot of people still use paper charts. Uh, they think they're great and reliable, whatever. You, you, you'll never run out of battery on a paper charts, but you know what will happen? You can have it attached to your kneeboard right here on your leg, and then when you're flipping the chart so you can see the next side, it can accidentally fly out the, uh, the open door over here. 
oh, what a shame. Also, those charts expire, and they don't show uh, temporary flight restrictions and uh, other dangers, and they also don't show you your GPS coordinates, and there's a lot of disadvantages to using paper charts as your, uh, your primary means of navigation, which is why I use an iPad. Up front here, uh, using the power of RAM mounts, I've uh, set a, an iPad, and this makes navigation so much easier. I know there are a variety of apps that you can use for navigating, but not to me. The only app that matters is ForeFlight. It's the one I've been using uh, ever since I made the move to iPad, and it's just fantastic. Everything I need to do um, as a pilot is, is included in ForeFlight. So that includes, this sounds like an advertisement. I'm not getting paid by ForeFlight. I should be getting paid by ForeFlight, but I really just like the app. Uh, my checklists are in there uh, for pre-flight and uh, starting up the helicopter and all phases of flight. Um, I can use uh, the logbook function, so rather than having paper uh, paper logbook. Funny story about logbooks, uh, I had a paper logbook that I got when I first started flying way back in 2008, and then uh, a cat that we owned that has died since, probably for the best, uh, peed all over my irreplaceable pilot's logbook. That's the kind of thing that if the cat peed on my iPad, it wouldn't matter. I mean, I wouldn't want cat pee on my iPad, but it wouldn't really matter. If you want to dig into my, my personal pilot log, I have to pull out my sealed logbook, which even to today probably still smells like cat piss. Damn it, Maurice, you were an edgy cat. At some point, we could probably dig into use of an iPad while flying a little bit deeper. Um, I'll just also mention that this little guy right here, this is Sentry. It's by the same people who make ForeFlight. It has ADS-B in functionality. ADS-B is a technology that's going to be mostly mandatory for general aviation, wherein your aircraft will constantly transmit its position, and then other aircraft can see where that position is. So this provides that functionality. So I can see a lot of other aircraft, and it pops up right here on the iPad. It also has a carbon monoxide detector, so if uh, dangerous gas is entering the cabin from the engine compartment, it will tell me about that. And the last thing it has is GPS, so the iPad doesn't have to use its internal GPS and cellular technology to try and locate itself, and that saves batteries. That's a really good combination. And as a backup, in case you're wondering, I have an iPhone. Super reliable. Up front, we have all the critical gauges, uh, rotor and engine speed here, altimeter, vertical speed indicator. This shows my fuel flow and uh, how much power I'm using in terms of manifold pressure. Uh, right in the middle is my airspeed indicator. Top speed is 117. Everybody always asks how fast can the helicopter go. 117 is the max. Here's the artificial horizon, which is better than the actual horizon. And then down here, I've just got a variety of gauges. Fuel gauge, main rotor gearbox, temperature, uh, amps, and uh, oil pressure, oil temp, cylinder temp. Oh, and this little uh, guy over here, which is not on, is uh, fairly helpful. It uh, shows the um, exhaust gas temperature on each cylinder, also the cylinder head temp, and then the uh, turbo inlet temp. And I can use that turbo inlet temp to lean the engine for better fuel economy when I'm in cruise mode. Got a variety of switches right here. And then down here, we've got a radio and a transponder. Uh, we don't need to talk too much about what all that does. The critical stuff is that uh, it's a really fairly simple helicopter. It's got all the essentials, and that's pretty much it. If it wasn't for that iPad over there, uh, this would, would be a lot like flying in 1978, which is the year this thing was built. And now right now you're probably thinking, 1978? I wouldn't get into a helicopter built in 1978. But the thing about that is that even though the basic structure was built in 1978, critical components are largely updated. That's not the engine that came in the helicopter. The rotor head, a lot of features have been updated there. The interior is new. I mean, basically, the way it works with aviation is that the parts that are on your aircraft have a, a lifespan. And by the time they reach that lifespan, the end of their lifespan, you get a new one. And so you just kind of keep rotating parts out. There's a Greek myth about a boat where they uh, take planks off and then eventually replace every plank. And then they build a boat from the planks that they took off, raising the question, which one is the original boat? It's a needlessly philosophical way of saying this is not necessarily the same helicopter that came off the uh, factory line in 1978. And I'm going to point out, and this is just a personal preference, but I think the Enstrom 280C looks super cool. Like if you didn't know that it was built in 1978, would you think it was built in 1978? No, you, you probably wouldn't. Last thing before we wrap up here, one of the great things about the Enstrom 280C is that if you look up there, this is what's called 
a fully articulated rotor system. The way a fully articulated blade system works is it allows each blade to lead, lag, and flap independently, uh, which is unlike if you see like a Robinson R44 that has just two blades. Basically, they work as a unit. So when one is flapping up, the other is flapping down. We don't need to get needlessly technical, but uh, there are some safety advantages to having a fully articulated system. It's a little bit more complex, but uh, it, it makes for a safer uh, helicopter, which I think is, is great. And it's got a ton of rotational mass. There's a lot of weight up there, which, okay, uh, earlier I was saying that weight is the enemy of aviation, but in this case, having all that weight in the rotor system is great because if the engine stops, not great, but with all that mass, the blades are more likely to keep spinning, unlike a low inertia rotor system. So when the engine stops, you have to lower the collective, and assuming you do so with relative haste, the blades will just keep spinning like those little leaves that fall out of trees. Damn it, another plane taking off. Beat it! That's a really quick look at my 1978 Enstrom 280C. I've had some great adventures with it, but now I'll be documenting those here. If there's anything you guys would like to see or if you have any questions, leave them in the comments. Be sure to like and subscribe, which is a thing that people say, and I kind of hate it because it's cliche, but you know, I do like your likes and your subs. Lastly, just to make sure that this helicopter thing crosses over just slightly with the automotive world, over my right shoulder, that is a Kia Sorento. It's one of my favorite reviews that I did for Kelly Blue Book uh, in the last year or two. There's a squirrel involved. It's a very fun review, go check it out. And now one last lingering shot of my Enstrom 280C. Ah, oh, what a sweet helicopter. To be clear, there are sweeter helicopters. Uh, you know what I really want? I want the Magnum PI helicopter, a Hughes 500. I'd never be as cool as TC, but if I could fly that helicopter, I think that would be the best. But in the meantime, this Enstrom 280C ain't half bad.